The first Republican debate is next week. And the big question for Republican voters and the Fox execs who recently held a pleading dinner with him is, will Donald Trump show up? Skipping debates isn't exactly new for the four times indicted non-billionaire. Call it an unoriginal rerun of his 2016 playbook. According to NBC News, Trump has told people he will not attend, opting instead for a sit-down interview with a guy who used to have a really racist show on Fox. What's his name again? I don't know. I just can't recall. Something related to Swanson fish sticks? Colton Carlson? Something. Anywho, Trump's team says nothing has been decided. So apparently whoever that guy is hasn't even confirmed. But if Trump's not there, the top target on the stage will very likely be the distant runner-up in most of the polls, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. So what's his plan? Well... <laughs> the DeSantis Super PAC never backed down, posted a debate strategy memo that urged the Disney battler to attack President Biden and distant fourth or fifth place candidate Vivek Ramaswamy while defending Trump and amazingly show emotion, a thing he struggled with for most of his political career. It is hard to overstate how baffling it is that this stuff was written down, let alone published by someone ostensibly on his side. One Republican strategist told NBC, quote, if I wanted to sabotage Ron DeSantis, I'd write this dung debate strategy memo and put it online and then tip off a reporter. Which someone apparently did. Joining me now are Dino Vidala, host of Sirius XM's Dino Vidala Show and an MSNBC Daily columnist. And Brian Taylor Cohen, Brian Tyler Cohen, progressive YouTube creator and an MSNBC political contributor. Thank you all for being here, Brian. I mangled your name because reading is fundamental, so I'm going to make you go first. Um, <laughs> I have to be honest with you, like, I used to work in campaigns, and I can tell you one thing we would never do <laughs> is put forward the debate strategy so that we could follow, so that Dean Obadala could follow by long and make fun of this man throughout the whole debate, which Dean is going to do. He's nodding. But I just want to get your take first. I'm going to let you go first. Uh, here's his four basic must-dos. Attack Joe Biden in the media three to five times. State, state a positive vision two to three times. Hammer Vivek Ramaswamy in a response. And defend Donald Trump in abstention in response to Chris Christie's attack. Uh, your thoughts? <laughs> Look, I'm no high-profile high political consultant, right? But I guess I'm of the mind that when you are competing with someone for anything, uh, the goal is generally to try and beat them. Donald Trump is the only thing standing between Ron DeSantis and winning the Republican nomination as it stands right now. And so, you know, it really is telling that weakness and capitulation are kind of built into his campaign. And so I don't see how there's a path to victory when losing is the strategy, the purposeful strategy to get you there. You know, uh, Dean, number one, first of all, how many times are you going to make fun of Ron DeSantis per hour when he does any of these things? Because I anticipate it's going to be hilarious and that you're going to do it like every time. <laughs> We will, but you know who's going to do it in real time? Chris Christie. And Chris Christie's going yeah. to print that out and go, oh, look, Ron, you're following along there. <laughs> Paragraph three. You just attacked me twice, defending Donald Trump. Oh, three to five times, you attacked Joe Biden. It's going to be prices. We're all going to be laughing. They should do a drinking game. Every time he does one of the things, and then by the end of it, everyone's just drunk and wasted. So, look, it, it's, I, and what's missing from the list is Ron DeSantis is going to come out wearing a MAGA hat and MAGA gear and carrying a MAGA flag. This whole thing's going to be a salute to Donald Trump, the fascist leader. It's not a debate. It's like, how much I love Trump more. No, I love Trump more. And then when, when Chris Christie criticizes, they're going to be chanting to his face, Trump, Trump, Trump. This is going to be unlike any debate we've ever seen in our lives. It, it, it's so, it's wild. Uh, okay, because what's, what's happening, Brian, is that you're going to have a Trump cheerleading fest on Fox and then Trump cheerleading, a cheerleading fest on what Twitter spaces or whatever they call the thing now with, you know, yeah. the guy that used to have a Fox, that got fired from Fox, you know. And so they're all going to be cheering for Trump. Why even have a debate if the whole point of all of it is just to, they're all going to cheer for Trump and Trump's cheering for Trump, too? Yeah, I mean, that that is the whole point. They're all apparently running for second place. I mean, I'm not sure what they're actually trying to do. They're stuck in this weird spot where obviously they purportedly want to win the Republican nomination themselves, and yet all of them are too scared to A, go after him because they don't want to incur the wrath of Donald Trump himself, and B, they have, you know, allowed, they have groomed, basically, the Republican base to believe any, everything and anything that Donald Trump says, and so when he has said all these lies and everything, now, now they believe every word he says, and so th they believe him now. They're on his team now, through thick and thin, and so there's really no way through this because of what they've done themselves and what they continue to do by continuing to entrench his superiority in the Republican Party. And, you know, let's talk about um, 
this this guy, Ron DeSantis, for just a moment, Dean. Yeah. Some Florida Republicans say that they really did respect him to implode. You know, there is a saying in Florida, there are two kinds of people in Florida, people who think that uh, Ron DeSantis can be president and people who've met Ron DeSantis. There is a famous or infamous story that Gwen Graham, who was a you know member of Congress, fellow member of Congress with him at one point, they were both running in 2018. She's running for a spot. He was running for governor. They ran into each other in the airport. He had his headphones in and pretended he didn't see her. She's talking to him. He's just not responding and just acted like he didn't see her. And she said it was one of the weirdest moments of her political career. That is a well-known story about Ron DeSantis. People are openly you know, giving quotes about how weird and awkward he is. What do you expect him to do other than do the things on his list? Like, is he going to be polling number two after the debate? Can you imagine that? Uh, that no, first of all, Ron DeSantis is doing a great impression of a human being, but he's failing at that. Like, he is human-esque. He is not human. There's no warmth at all. I will say, on paper, his pedigree, really impressive. Yale, graduate with honors, captain of the baseball team. Harvard Law School with honors, serves in the military. So there he has that. Then you meet the guy and you're like, that's the guy from the resume? <laughs> so at, at the debate, I expect Ron Sins to pick up the paper and actually read it, what he's supposed to be doing. But I think, honestly, Trump's making a mistake. I think a star is going to be born in this debate. We've seen it in Democratic debates in 2020. Somebody emerges, and then the media gravitates around them. The person raises funds, and then Trump is then stuck with someone who's not going to catch them or not right away but actually a competitor. And it won't be Ron DeSantis. I'm not sure. It could be Tim Scott. It could be Nikki Haley. I'm not sure who it's going to be. But I can assure you, the media is going to crown a winner from that debate. It's going to drive Donald Trump crazy. You, the, 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 actually, the, the showdown I really do want to see, though, honestly, is Chris Christie versus Trump. Bully versus bully. I really want to see that. It is interesting, uh, Brian, that Rupert Murdoch has a candidate that, you know, as Dean describes, and it is the governor of Virginia, the book banning, um, you know, racist -ish governor, <laughs> like no book, no black books, no black history governor of Virginia. Your thoughts on them trying to find their own candidate, uh, the Murdochs? I mean, it's the same problem that I was speaking about before. They they have spent so long running cover for Donald Trump that the idea that they're going to be able to pry the same viewers who they agreed, who they groomed to follow Donald Trump off the cliff is just is asinine. I mean, he runs that party and it's by their own help. So this idea that Rupert Murdoch thinks he's going to come and pry them away from the very people who he pushed toward Donald Trump just kind of defies logic. Yeah, it, it all of it does. Uh, OK, well, well, Dean and Brian are, have graciously agreed to stick around. Any legislative body may decide on the basis of overwhelming evidence of fraud to send electors to the Electoral College who accurately reflect the president's legitimate victory in their state, which was illegally denied him through fraud. Sounds awfully like the fake electors plot, right? He was calling for this on November 5th, 2020, days after the election, when people had voted, but the race had not yet been called. Meaning Roger Stone, AKA the grown man with a Nixon back tattoo, was pushing this widespread fraud lie regardless of the results, which again, weren't even in yet. And it would be still another month before Kenneth Cheeseborough would author the memo that outlined the actual fake elector scheme. Now that we've got two indictments that tell the story in slightly different ways, are the prosecutions even close to being over? Given that the plot to steal the 2020 election is much broader and more national than we ever even thought. I am joined now by Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel, former senior member of Robert Mueller's special counsel and an MSNBC legal analyst. And boy, oh boy, Andrew, does it just the plot just keeps getting thicker and thicker and thicker with more and more characters. But I want to focus on a couple of them with you for just a second. Let's start with Roger Stone. So Roger Stone, we know now from this exclusive uh, piece of video gotten from a documentary that uh, the folks at The Beat got was talking through what sounded like the fake electors plot days after the election. But I want to play, what, play you what he was doing even before the election. This is on November 1st, 2020. Here he is, Roger Stone. I suspect it'll be, I really do suspect it will still be up in the air. But when that happens, the key thing to do is to claim victory. 
Possession is nine tenths of the law. No, we won. F you. Sorry, over. We won. Yeah. You're wrong. F you. Andrew, Roger Stone's name does not appear in either of the two indictments, which I have read, and I am enjoying reading them because it is so fascinating. His name ain't in either of them. Does that surprise you? Now it does, um, given <laughs> given what uh, we have, what the thing that you just played, and also the evidence that the beat uncovered. Um, obviously, I'm very aware of Roger Stone. He was somebody that we prosecuted in the Mueller investigation. He was convicted, as just to remind everyone, on all counts at a trial by a jury. Twelve citizens found unanimously he was guilty of all charges, and Donald Trump commuted that sentence uh, just days before. And Bill Barr, just to be clear, had a role in that, because Bill Barr mm -hmm. wanted to also sort of essentially get rid of the sentence recommendation there and help Donald Trump's friends, of which this was one. And what did Roger Stone do, according to what you just did, is what you just played, is while you're out on bail awaiting sentencing, um, you're engaging in a coup. Um, so yeah. you can understand why the Department of Justice would feel like he has not been sufficiently held to account, because essentially Donald Trump erased his last uh, finding of criminality. So I think he's one of the people who I think we're going to see uh, additional. We're going to see charges. Um, I think that's true of Chesbro. I think it's going to be true at the federal level for a whole variety of people. Uh, I'd be very surprised if we didn't see charges against Chesbro, against Rudy Giuliani, um, a number of people. Um, I do think that the federal government probably wants to wait and see what the trial date is first with respect to Donald Trump. They're keeping their eye on the prize, so to speak. That's where their main focus is and I think should be. But these other players, um, I think that they, like Georgia, are going to hold them to account. History, but especially black history, is under attack in America, which is why documentaries are crucial for understanding this country's past. A new one, 70, 761st Tank Battalion, the original Black Panthers, tells the true story of the first black tank unit to serve in combat during World War II. While the majority black battalion was fighting one battle overseas, they were also fighting another in their home country against racism, segregation, and inequality. These heroes helped to liberate more than 30 cities and towns. They were the tip of Patton's spear. They fully integrated the armed forces. Black veterans become major figures in the civil rights movement. I really want to see the 761st finally get the recognition they deserve. Because these men really did come out fighting. That is right. The one and only Morgan Freeman is here with me on set. The Academy Award winning actor is also the executive producer of 761st Tank Battalion, the original Black Panthers, which premieres on the History Channel. And we should note that the documentary was produced under SAG's basic cable agreement, which is outside the scope of the strike order. As such, Mr. Freeman is able to be here to promote the film. I am the luckiest person alive <laughs> that I get to be here with you. Um, Mr. Freeman, thank you so much for being here. It's nice to be here with you, Joy. So tell us about the 761st, but also your personal connection to this story and why you wanted to do it. Uh, I'd never heard of them until, what, 12 or so years ago? I don't know, 20 years ago, I think. And a guy came to us with a, a script, a story about this tank battalion that was served on the Patton. Wait a minute, I saw Patton. What do you mean, tank battalion? Well, we started getting into that, getting up with this history, and yes, indeedy. When Patton ran out of uh, men and materials, and uh, a couple of months after the invasion, Europe, he said, somebody go find me some tanks. So they went and they found the 761st. They've been training since. 1942. They wouldn't let her come over there and fight because, uh, well, these people, they just, they won't work out in the tank, you mm -hmm. know. Being in the tank, it needs, number one, the courage just to stay there. Right. 
And then you got to think fast a lot of mm-hmm. times. And I, you know, I, these fellows are just not going to manage that. I just, I can't hope that well. Here they come. Mm-hmm. And when it was all over, they never actually rotated back from the front lines. They were that effective that if you needed something done, um, where the seven sixty first now? Yeah. Suddenly they realized that these. Black Lives Matter and that they knew what they were doing. And Absolutely. Come Out Fighting was their, I love that, Come Out Fighting was their um, sort of their slogan. Yeah. You got a chance to actually speak with a survivor, maybe the final surviving member. His name is Corporate Robert Curtis Andre. Yes. Talk about him. Yeah. Uh, well, he was, I think he only survived up to the second battle they had, the second encounter. And Something went off in the tank. Uh, they got hit. Shrapnel just littered his body. And uh, they took him out of the tank, laid him on the side of the road in a shallow ditch, covered him up with ferns and grass and dirt uh, in order to, so that they could find him when they come back, if they came back, if they came back, yeah. or whatever was coming over. Was coming over. And he survived that. And when I was talking to him, he, you. You talk to veterans of combat, and they can't tell you much. Yeah. You know, it was hell. I was there. Mm-hmm. So details, somebody called that the bog of war. Right? Yeah. yeah. But they got him. He survived. And his body is still uh, shedding shrapnel, just working its wow. way out of his... Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, the fact that um, that you executive produced this documentary at this time when history is under attack and black history specifically, there is this sort of sense among some people in this country that it is dangerous to tell our stories, that our stories will somehow make white Americans feel bad, you know, and giving the truth of our history. Why do you think it is important to insist upon telling our history anyway? If you don't understand and learn from history. The mistakes that you made are not just going to come around again. This country, bless our hearts, tried really, really hard to tamp down what we know is under the rocks and hiding in bushes. And if we don't know about it, if we don't learn from it and learn to recognize it and have the courage to deal with it, we're just going to wind up back where we were, which is not where we want to be. Yeah. And the thing about the World War Two, you know, the black men who fought in World War Two, and there were significant numbers of them, is that they really were key to the civil rights movement. They came home from having seen the world. Um, having traveled more than most white Americans ever had, right, who didn't serve, and said, you know what? No, we insist upon being able to vote. We insist upon being able to have dignity and to be treated with respect. That really was key to this. It's like you need the connections to understand history in general. Yeah, a lot of them had the first experience with being respected Mm -hmm. in Europe when they got to England and got to France and that welcomed with open arms. This is American fighting men. Yeah. Come on in. Um, Treated with dignity. And so you say it can happen. So we're going to insist on it at home. There is only one uh, Morgan Freeman, the great Morgan Freeman. Thank you. It is an honor just to meet you and be able to talk to you. And I truly mean that. This seems like an incredible documentary. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much for that, Joy. Thank you very much. Wonderful to look at those dark brown eyes. Okay. I hereby retire. Thank you all for having me. Uh, uh. (laughs) 761st Tank Battalion, the original Black Panthers, premieres August 20th on the History Channel. You must watch it. You have been asked and commanded by God himself. We'll be right back.